It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My first question is for the Premier. In recent weeks, private, for-profit health care providers have been coming forward to declare their interest in being part of the government's health care scheme. In London, Ontario, a private clinic owned by the Advanced Medical Group says they're ready and willing to take on surgeries at their private operating room. And in Toronto, a private option clinic calling itself, quote, Mom and Baby Depot, says they're excited, I quote, excited to build and be part of an Ontario health team, end quote. Can the Premier tell us, will for-profit corporations like these ones be allowed to be a part of Ontario health teams, yes or no? Premier? Oh, through, through you, Mr. Speaker, I just have a, a couple uh, quick comments. You know, we, we, we may disagree in this chamber, we may spar back and forth with each other, but I just want to pass on my condolences to the MPP from Essex. His father passed away, and on behalf of the PC caucus, myself, I gave him a call. You know, when it comes to family and politics, we separate family, and then we come back in here and we go back and forth. But I just want to give him all my respects and uh, wish him and his family uh, all the blessings. Supplementary. I want to thank the Premier very much. Of course, uh, uh, the member for Essex uh, lost his father on the weekend, and I appreciate very much the Premier's remarks as well as uh, the condolences from the rest of your team as well as the other members. Very much appreciated. Um, um, back to the question, Speaker. The Premier insists that uh, his multi billion dollar mega health merger isn't opening the door to private health care, but families are finding that pretty hard to believe. To give just one example, the London area private clinic that I mentioned isn't just pushing for more for profit care. They also hosted uh, the Premier at an event during last spring's election campaign. It seems like a pretty cosy relationship. So again, my question to the Premier is, will for-profit corporations like these be allowed to be a part of Ontario health teams, yes or no? Premier? Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the Leader of the Official Opposition for the question, and I extend my condolences to the member from Essex and his family as well. Um, but to the specifics of your question, what we have stated from the very beginning is we are trying to strengthen our public health care system with the introduction of the plan that's contained in Bill 74. That is what it's all about. We want to make sure that people get the connected care that they need and deserve, and we are going to be working with Ontario Health issuing very strict criteria for any organizations that want to band together to become local Ontario health teams. They're going to have to, first of all, meet the criteria of being able to manage the funds that will be allocated to them. They have to make sure that they maintain the quality of care that will be expected Fox. from them. And they also need to continue to involve patients and families in all aspects of designing the care and delivering the care. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, what I was hoping to hear from the minister is that they can do all of that work in a not-for-profit manner, Speaker. That's what we're wanting to hear from this minister and this premier. But here's what families see. A premier that's promised no layoffs is already firing nurses, frontline health care workers and other health professionals. Meetings are being held behind closed doors without any public input or accountability. And private for-profit health interests seeking to profit from our health care system already seem to have the premier on speed dial. So will the premier do the right thing by the people of this province and be very, very clear? Will for-profit co corporations like this be allowed to be a part of Ontario health teams? Yes or no? Members, please take their seats. Question can refer to the Deputy Premier and Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. 
Well, first of all, I can assure the Leader of the Official Opposition that the people of Ontario will be receiving the care that they expect and deserve uh, should Bill 74 pass, which I urge you to support because we are strengthening our public health care system and it will be up to the uh, local organizations to decide how they wish to band together, whether they wish to form a partnership of joint venture or whatever. Come to order. But I can tell you that I have been traveling throughout the province and I have been speaking with groups that are Opposition. Already come to providing order. integrated care in Barry and Bracebridge and North Bay and Arnprior. Leader of the opposition, come to order. Across this province, I can tell you that health care providers are excited about having some of the roadblocks taken away that the Ministry of Health has put up over the years, and that patients and providers are also very excited about it because we, they know that we are Response. going to connect care for them and make sure that they get care throughout their entire life. That's not happening right now. That's what we are going to do. Thank you. Stop the clock. We start the clock. Next question, the Leader of the Official Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Uh, this is a question about the integrity of our electoral process and comments made by the Premier in this Assembly. Last week, the Premier raised serious allegations and even threatened to call police concerning what he called illegal fundraising by my party. As it happens, New Democrats on this side of the House have serious concerns of our own about a fundraising event organized by the Progressive Conservative Party. So will the Premier agree that serious concerns like these deserve a thorough investigation? Premier. Through you, Mr. Speaker. We're doing fundraisers all over the province. I was just in Ottawa. Our base is made up of the average common folk going to $25 a night spaghetti dinners. Here, here. Unlike the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Speaker, unlike the Leader of the Opposition, that charges $800, and if you go to the fundraising event, you get a reward. A reward, you get to meet the Leader of the Opposition. I'll tell you, we give rewards, too. We give rewards to the people that voted for us and the rest of Ontario by lowering their heating costs, lowering their gas prices, lowering their taxes, creating good-paying jobs. That's the reward the people of Ontario get. Members, please take their seats. Supplementary. Well, I think this, uh, the um, uh, Premier is going to be pretty shocked when he finds out they didn't want to be rewarded with the privatization of their health care system. If the people of Ontario, however, are going to have confidence in our democracy, they need to know that all parties are playing by the rules. The Premier made a serious allegation last week. He repeated it just now in the House, and I think it's important that we clear the air. I'm confident that an investigation will clear up any concerns that he has about NDP fundraising, and that's why I'm inviting all parties to join me in asking Elections Ontario to thoroughly investigate all political party fundraising in the province. I have a letter here that I sent to the Premier's office already. I'll ask a page to send it back over to him now. And the question is, will the Premier add his name to this request to the Chief Electoral Officer? To Thank you. To the Premier. Premier. Through, thank you. <laughs> through, through you. Through you, Mr. Speaker. Our donors are grassroots. Our donors are the $5, $10, $15 donations. Mr. Speaker, Opposition, come to I, order. I, am, I am so proud. We sent out a letter. We sent out a letter a couple of weeks ago, just a simple one, two, three line uh, letter. And guess what, Mr. Speaker? We raised $100,000 on five and 10 and $15 donations. That's grassroots. That's standing up for the people. That's who we represent. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier made a serious allegation about party fundraising, and we need to clear the air to ensure that his concerns are properly investigated. But the Premier seems reluctant. Perhaps that's because there are also very serious concerns about his party's fundraising. Allegations that lobbyists will lose access if they don't sell tickets to the Premier's dinner. Media locked out while uh, well-connected donors talk shop with the Premier at $1,250 a plate dinners. The Premier insists he has nothing to hide, Speaker. Then why won't he put his name on the dotted line and join Join us in calling for a full and complete investigation by Elections Ontario. Members, please take their seats. Premier. Oh, uh, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker. I just. <laughs> I got. 
you, you can't help but laugh in the chamber. Yeah. And you, you listen to the rhetoric. I, I just can't believe it. Mr. Speaker, we're focused again on making sure that we take care of the grassroots people. And uh, they, they don't need access to Doug Ford. They call me on my cell phone. I get hundreds of calls a day. Yep. I return their phone calls. I meet these people at these $25 uh, a night spaghetti dinners. And you can tell I haven't missed too many spaghetti dinners, <laughs> Mr. Speaker. So I love them. And that's how we're going to continue moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. My next question is also to the Premier, but I must say I'm pretty disappointed that a simple ask for accountability is being denied by this Premier. Uh, the Premier and the Minister have claimed uh, that uh, the process that appointed Ron Tavener OPP Commissioner was independent. In fact, to quote the Minister, the hiring committee was independent of government. However, the Integrity Commissioner's report, released last Wednesday, reveals that the Secretary of Cabinet told the Premier's Chief of Staff, Dean French, in no uncertain terms, that the process should not be described as independent and that the word should be dropped altogether. Is the Premier prepared to correct his record, Speaker? Premier. Minister of Economic Development. Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Thanks, uh, thanks Speaker. Uh, unfortunately, the NDP is going to continue on this uh, line of questioning, which actually has already uh, come to a culmination thanks to the findings of the Independent Integrity Commissioner of the Province of Ontario, who issued his report last week, which completely, I must say, exonerated the Premier for any involvement in what the NDP and Democracy Watch were alleging. You know Democracy Watch, Mr. Speaker? Democracy Watch has instigated eight different investigations into this government, all of which have been frivolous. Yeah. All of them. I mean, Wait. it's like they're on some kind of political crusade themselves, Mr. Speaker. What I can tell you is that the member opposite, the leader of the opposition, should be respecting the decision of the independent yeah. integrity commissioner of Ontario. That's what we're doing here. We thank him for his findings and his report. Supplementary. Well, I think the, um, I think the uh, House Leader would remember that the Integrity Commissioner also recommended a full public inquiry because there are lots of questions not answered by that report. But look, if the, if the Premier is confident in Mr. Orsini as he claims to be in the media, in this House, and in his testimony to the Integrity Commissioner, it's odd that the Premier and his minister repeatedly continued to call the hiring process independent when Orsini was begging him not to do so. The Premier told the people of Ontario, and he told this House, uh, that the process was completely independent. Now, we have a lot of witnesses here today in the chamber, so I want the Premier to think carefully before he answers this question. Is he standing by those claims, or is he ready to admit that he was wrong and clarify his record? Question has been referred to the Minister of Job Creation. Thanks, Speaker, and thanks to the member opposite for the question. It's shameful, really, that the NDP just won't accept the findings of the Integrity Commissioner of the Province of Ontario. You know, the member opposite has now asked five consecutive questions this morning that have absolutely nothing to do with government policy. And I can understand why, Mr. Speaker, because the government policy that we're introducing here in Ontario is having a positive impact yeah. on the people of Ontario. It's it, it, it's tough for them to criticize when we're reducing taxes, getting rid of the cap-and-trade program. It's tough for them to criticize when Minister Rickford is tackling the electricity mess in Ontario by introducing legislation to take that on. It's tough for them, really. It's tough for them to ask questions about job creation when the Premier's plan has created 95,000 jobs in Ontario in the last three months, Mr. Speaker. I can understand why the member opposite wants to stay in the gutter, because when it comes to policy, we're bringing Ontario back. Restart the clock. Next question, the member for Ottawa West, Nepean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. I was pleased to see the Premier and the Minister of Transportation in Ottawa last week to make a very important announcement that our government is providing 
$1.2 billion for Phase 2 of Ottawa's LRT, the largest infrastructure project in Ottawa's history. Mr. Speaker, this is big news for the people of Ottawa. I know myself, my colleagues from Ottawa, and my constituents are very excited about this announcement. I am proud to represent the people of Ottawa West Nepean, and by expanding rail service all the way out to Moody Station and Algonquin College, we're going to make it easier for my constituents to get around our great city and see all that it has to offer. So, Mr. Speaker, Question. can the Premier tell us more about this exciting announcement that he and the Minister of Transportation made in Ottawa last week? Thank you. Premier. Thank you. I want to thank the outstanding member from Ottawa, West Nepean, Jeremy, your absolute champion, great, great guy, great representative, couldn't ask for a better person. Yes, the, the member was mentioning we had a great visit up in Ottawa, met uh, Mayor Watson. Mayor Watson is just an incredible mayor. He's doing a fantastic job up there. And we're partnering with the, the City of Ottawa, putting $1.2 billion into Phase 2 of the LRT. Yeah, yeah. We had our whole team there, Minister of Transportation, other representatives from Ottawa. And I can tell you, uh, Speaker, we're building 44 kilometres of track. That end, uh, I'm sorry? Include your response. <laughs> Thank you. And through you, Mr. Speaker, I still couldn't hear what you said. Anyway, through you, Mr. Speaker, we are providing transportation to the people of Ottawa, again, the largest infrastructure project in Ottawa's history, and I'm so happy we can move 24,000 people an hour. Thank you. <laughs> Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, through you, thank you to the Premier for that great response and for your kind words. Our government and our Premier are both strong supporters of public transit and making life easier for the people of Ontario. I know that this project will transform the way that the people of Ottawa and our commuters move around our great city. The new LRT will reduce gridlock and help people get to work, school, or appointments more quickly and conveniently. However, Mr. Speaker, this is not just good news for public transit users. It's also great use, news for people who drive, because this will reduce congestion on the roads, thereby freeing up time spent at work. Uh, so that people can be at home with their family and friends. So, can Question. the Premier tell us more about Phase 2 of Ottawa's LRT? Premier. Thank, thank you. From the member. This project will make it a lot easier, a lot easier for nurses to get to the hospital in Ottawa or CHEO. It will make it a lot easier for students to get to Algonquin College up there. My friends, we're going to move 24,000 people an hour. And you know what's the best news of all, Mr. Speaker? It's creating 1,000 yeah, great yeah. paying jobs. Thank you. Next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Education. The government's plan to have high school students take the equivalent of an entire semester of coursework online is raising alarms with parents and experts alike. While the data is scarce, what we do know is that far too many students fail to complete these courses because they don't have the supports they need. Questions are swirling Government about side, come to technology, order. suitability for all types of learners, and the overall quality of the educational experience. Can the minister provide any evidence that shifting 440 hours of in-person learning out of the classroom and online will be good for students? Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's a pleasure to stand today in this House and talk about the amazing ways we're bringing education back in Ontario. We're making yeah, yeah. education work for you, your sons, 
families of our, our families of our members in this house, our teachers, and every single person who cares about making sure that we correct the mess that the Liberal government, the past administration, mired us into. And let's talk about online learning for a second. Do you know there are school boards across this province that lead by example, and their students are embracing online learning. They're, it doesn't matter whether it's rural Ontario, northern Ontario, or urban Ontario. Teachers and boards are leading the way. And my question back to the member opposite is, why is she so caught up in the past? Why on earth is that Response. member in the past and not embracing the technology for the good it can bring into our classrooms? All I can say to that speaker is, shame on her. Okay. Stop. Thank you. We start the clock. Supplementary, the member for Davenport. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the minister knows perfectly well this is not about preparing students to use technology or build resiliency. It is about less face-to-face -face learning, less one-on-one -on -one attention, because this government is cutting 10 and teaching jobs and forcing students into mandatory online courses. Government side, the come to order. Member for Carleton, come to order. Unilaterally change graduation Bond, requirements with the stroke of a pen here. It also signaled that the delivery of e-learning programs would be shifted away from school boards and centralized. Parents don't know who will be delivering these courses, where or how students will take them, or what will happen if students fail to complete the courses. Minister, who will be delivering online? courses to Ontario students. Minister. You know, you know what, you. Mr. Speaker? <laughs> Honest to goodness, and to the people watching, I say, please, don't get caught up in the rhetoric of this opposition party because it's absolutely yes. nothing but nonsense that yes. they're spewing across Ontario. So the fact of the matter is, in my home riding of Kieran Bruce, Avon Maitland is doing a phenomenal job bringing math into the classroom and supplementing it with online facts and learning. Honest to Pete, there's so many great examples that we can use as best practices. Seriously, Speaker, this party is doing nothing but fear -mongering. And to that end, I want to quote the CBC fact check from yesterday, where you know we've heard this party opposite go on and on and cause fear in parents and teachers alike. But the CBC fact check Response. just yesterday said boosting the average secondary size to 28 would see Ontario rank on the lower end of the spectrum wow. across Canada. So, Members, please take your seats. And I'll inform again the government members that once the standing ovation erupted, I could not hear the Minister of Education, even though she's quite close. I had to stand up and interrupt her. Also, come to order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Barry Innisfil. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government for the people has been working hard, hard to deliver on our campaign promises. We promise to end the liberal culture of waste, and that is what we are doing. There is no better example of that than our government's commitment to this promise than the recent announcement made by the Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines. Last week, the minister tabled the Fixing uh, Hydro Mess Act, the start of a reform for electricity system so that it works for the people, not the insiders. Unlike the Liberals, we are actually listening to the people, and they told us the system was inefficient and it was not transparent. The Ontario Energy Board was out of date. It was neglected by the previous government for 15 years, 15 long years while the OEB held up key projects, Mr. Speaker. Question. Can the minister please tell the members of this House about the steps our government is taking to reform the OEB and Bill 87? Good question. 
Minister of Energy, Northern Development and Mines, and Minister of Thank Indigenous you, Mr. Affairs. Speaker, and I want to thank the member from Barry Innisfil for outstanding work for her constituents and her support on this important piece of legislation. Mr. Speaker, there couldn't be a more important time for us to modernize the Ontario Energy Board. We've heard it from stakeholders across this province, Mr. Speaker. I spoke at the Electricity Distributors Association meeting last night. More than 400 people involved in the business of local distribution companies applauded loudly when we told them that we would be putting an end to thousands and thousands of page submissions to the Energy Board for fairly routine uh, regulatory matters, Mr. Speaker. We heard loud and clear from Indigenous communities when the east-west high was announced over overriding unforeseen delays installing hundreds of indigenous people from across northern Ontario who wanted to get to work on this important project mr. speaker it sounds like we have some support here I'm just going to read a quote here from, member from Toronto da Danforth I would say at best the Ontario Energy Board the regulator is a drowsy chaperone and at worst they're a glove puppet will he stand with us mr. speaker and support the clean up the hydro thank you Supplementary. Thank you to the uh, minister for taking a strong lead on this important file and listening to the people of Ontario. Here, here. We know that the previous Liberal government didn't listen. They destroyed our electricity system Thank through their misguided ideological policies that forced families and businesses to, to pay way more on their hydro bills. Our government has already taken significant action to replace these faulty policies in favour of initiatives that promote a competitive, a low-cost electricity market. Now we're continuing with our plan, Mr. Speaker, to, to eliminate the waste and unnecessary costs to our electricity system. Can the minister please elaborate on the steps our government for the people is taking to overhaul the electricity system to make it more efficient and transparent? Minister. Mr. Speaker. Of course, what the member is talking about is the now famous trust fund cover-up, Mr. Speaker, a hydro uh, accounting scheme that kept the costs of this program hidden from the people paying the bill, from the people of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's why it was so important for our government to replace the global adjustment refinancing structure with a transparent on-bill rebate. Now, this transparent structure will save the people of Ontario more than four billion dollars in borrowing costs, Mr. Speaker. What does the NDP stand for on this matter, Mr. Speaker? The, 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 are they against transparency? Are they against the uh, Ontario Energy Board modernization? Are they against conservation programs that are focused on vulnerable families, seniors, and Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker? It's time they stood with us to support this important act. We're hearing it Response. from the people of Ontario. We're hearing it from stakeholders. Get with the times and support this bill, Mr. Speaker. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The new Ontario Autism Program starts in a week, and service providers are still being laid off. Child and Community Resources, which serves a large part of Northern Ontario, have cut 19 staff. We already know that northern and rural communities are underserved, and this disastrous new autism program is making it worse. Did the minister anticipate layoffs in northern communities when she designed this program? The minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Uh, let me be perfectly clear. Any layoffs uh, related to the changes of the Ontario Autism Program are completely uh, premature, and we're encouraging agencies to find a better way. We're going to clear the right la wait list over the next 18 months with 23,000 more children receiving some support from their Ontario government, which I would expect would mean we would need more service providers to support that. We've also said that we are going to eliminate the income test. We listened to parents. We've also listened to parents by encouraging more uh, more use of a, ch a choice for occupational therapy and speech and language therapy. We've decided to enhance the grace list, the grace period uh, for those on the existing program to an additional six months. And just yesterday, I met with Autism Ontario to prove we are reaching out and we are listening. We signed a $750,000 contract with Autism Ontario yesterday so they can continue to work with parents as we navigate through this new system. Response. But let me be perfectly clear. As of a result of this plan, 100% of the children, not 25% of the children with autism in Ontario, will receive support from their Ontario. That's great. 
supplementary. Speaker, as a result of this plan, families have been put in crisis, and we have a complete disaster of our autism program right now in the province because the minister failed to communicate before she put the policy in place. Speaker, there were not enough. There were not enough trained therapists in Northern Ontario before the changes to the Ontario Autism Program, and now there will be even fewer, as organizations like Child and Community Resource Centres are forced to make layoffs. The new Autism Program is making services harder to access for Northern and rural Ontarians. Instead of investing and strengthening autism services, this minister has gutted them. Did the minister know that her program would make it harder for children in the north to access services? Minister. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. As uh, the member opposite knows, we are doubling our investment into the diagnostic hubs so we can clear the 23,000 child waitlist, including making sure we have greater investments in northern Ontario because of the great leadership of our northern members, including the Minister of Finance and including the Minister of Northern Affairs. And I will uh, personally assure this, this member that uh, we have decided to invest more money than any other jurisdiction in North America in terms of autism services. It could almost be doubled the $321 million investment that we talked about. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Order. Start the clock. Next question, the member for Guelph. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. In January, an Ontario Supreme Court or Superior Court decision ruled that enforcement of animal welfare laws had to change. In early March, the OSPCA gave notice that it would no longer enforce these laws as of April 1st, just six days from now. Yet the government has not announced a plan to cover the gap. The Guelph Humane Society has asked the government for the authority to continue its enforcement efforts until a long-term solution is in place. Mr. Speaker, Will the government commit to protecting animals by allowing humane societies to continue using their expertise to enforce animal cruelty laws until a long-term plan is in place? Questions to the Premier. Well, Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the question. Animal welfare will always be of the utmost importance to our government. Well, we are committed to ensuring that animal welfare continues in the province, and both our government and the OSPCA have a long history and a shared commitment to protect animals in Ontario. We are actively reviewing the implications of this change to find a solution that works for everyone. And as we indicated earlier this year, we are actively exploring improvements to the animal welfare regime here in Ontario, even before the OSPCA's announcement. So we are continuing to work on it to find a solution that's going to continue to protect animals within this province. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, the clock is ticking. Six days, and we will not have an enforcement regime in place in Ontario. I've received thousands and thousands of emails about this issue, asking for the government to step up and make sure an interim plan is in place. Protections for animals should not be left in limbo. We clearly need stronger laws to protect animals in human care. Mr. Speaker, Will the government commit today to putting in place a transition plan for the enforcement of animal cruelty laws and start immediate consultations for a permanent plan to bring the investigation and enforcement of animal cruelty laws under public jurisdiction? Minister. Well, I thank the member opposite for your interest in and your commitment to animal welfare, which we obviously share on this side of the House. Here, here. We want to make sure that there is a solution that is in place for, every, for all animals that's going to work for everyone across the province. We are certainly well aware of the time commitments involved here. We are actively working on this file, and we will have more to say in the very short future. The member for Flamborough, Flamborough. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Toronto Star posted an article over the weekend and the headline was shocking. A 14-year-old girl is a sexually mature young woman, not a child, 
Children's Aid Society lawyer argues in sex abuse suit. As a member of the governing caucus, I found it disturbing to read such a thing, as I know for certain that this is not a position held by our government or the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party. Can the minister please shed some light on this case? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much uh, for that important question. As I read that article, I was embarrassed that somebody uh, would represent a children's aid society in Ontario making that statement. Let me tell you what I did. I have a 14-year-old daughter. She is a child. Any 14-year-old child in the care of this province is a child that we must protect. I immediately reached out to my deputy minister to inform her that the position of that defence lawyer was not the position or the views held by me as the minister, the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, or the government of Ontario today. It is not the position of our premier or this government caucus, and I, as, as I understand it, that lawyer is no longer with the Children's Aid Society of Ontario. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the minister. When I read the story, I was confident that our government would not accept this situation. Unfortunately, this House is reminded of the failures of our child welfare system far too often. Last fall, we heard from Ontario's chief coroner, who tabled a report on the death of children in care, and we were reminded that Indigenous children are disproportionately represented in care. Minister, we know this cannot continue. Can you please tell what our government is doing to improve the child welfare system? Minister. The coroner's report uh, that we've spoken about many times in this assembly was one of the most troubling uh, documents that I have ever written, where young girls in the care of the province of Ontario up to uh, 2017 um, have been trafficked in group homes. Uh, so this is not the first time when we see what's happened in Kenora that the standards that should be in place have not been met by our child welfare system. That is why we will bring in robust legislation to hold the Children's Aid Societies of this province to a higher standard. These are vulnerable children who deserve our protection, not turning a blind eye, and not certainly with the defence that the previous uh, defence uh, lawyer brought. We are going to Opposition encourage um, uh, more consultation with our Indigenous uh, children, as well as those who are Black in, in, and uh, those who are in custody and care. With three new roundtables, we recognize that those children are overrepresented. In addition, we Response. will be embedding within my ministry a children's advocate. But let me be clear, if you are receiving government funding to protect a child, I expect you to protect a child. Next question, the member for London, Fanshawe. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Today, a new poll revealed that 80 per cent of long-term care workers experience constant daily or weekly occurrences of violence on the job. These statistics are deeply disturbing, but unfortunately, we all have heard these stories too many times over the years. The violence is a direct result of understaffing in long-term care homes and an increasing needs of residents with dementia or other complex behavioural <clears throat> issues that comes with ageing. Speaker, what concrete steps is the minister taking to ensure adequate staffing levels in our long-term care homes so that this degree of workplace violence becomes a thing of the past? Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, I thank the member very much for the question. This is a concern I know throughout the province of Ontario, but let me be clear, our government has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to violence of any kind in the workplace, and the health and safety of all Ontarians is a priority for our government. And every person who works in a long-term care home should be able to go to work without feeling in danger or feeling that they are under attack from anyone in the home. But there are increasing levels of concern here, mostly as a result of the increasing levels of dementia for the residents in the long-term care homes, which is resulting in patient-on-patient -patient violence and patient-on-staff violence. We are studying this. We are looking at solutions to it. Some of it has to do with finding solutions to dementia. We've had a number of interesting proposals that have come forward to us in the Ministry of Health that can Response. help diminish this kind of behavior and allow patients to feel more comfortable and to feel less stress in the circumstances and less, like, less likely to act out. 
supplementary. Speaker, I know the government has announced creating new beds, but without supporting those beds with more staff, we will not be able to help uh, pre the prevention of the residents' um, violence uh, in, that's happening in long-term care. So today's poll on long-term care worker workplace violence is the second report since January to highlight the understaffing and lack of resources in Ontario's long-term care sector. Action is needed to be taken now. The Ontario government must create a long-term care strategy that properly plans for Ontario's aging population and includes a human resource strategy. Will the Minister of Health commit to immediately developing a long-term care strategy to fix the problems in long-term care, address workplace violence, and support frontline health care workers? Well, there are a number of actions that are already being taken, but of course more needs to be done, and we are already taking a look at health human resources issues across all levels, whether it's long-term care homes, hospitals, or home care, to make sure that we are going to be able to meet the increasing need as we are building more long-term care homes. We're already at about half of our commitment to reach 15,000 new long-term care spaces in the next five years. So we are working hard on that to make sure that we have the people available there. But we also need to make sure that we continue with the training of staff who work in long-term care homes who receive training on dealing with patients with dementia or behavioral issues. We're also working with our partners such as the Public Services Health and Safety Association Response. to make sure that long-term care homes protect their employees. So there is a lot of work that is currently being done. We want to make sure that everyone can be safe in their workplace and Thank you. Next question, the member for Don Valley East. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My uh, question is to the uh, Deputy Premier. I think we can all agree in the legislature that autism, uh, the file of autism is a, a very tough file, and there were no easy solutions uh, in this legislature for this government or even previous governments. But I've said many times, Mr. Speaker, that this is not a partisan issue. So, through you to the, uh, to the Deputy Premier, Mr. Speaker, does the Deputy Premier think it's appropriate that the Minister of Children and Community Services sent out an email yesterday using autism and families who are in crisis to fundraise for the PC party? And does the Deputy Premier think it's appropriate to use a government press release in that email? Okay. The Deputy Premier. To the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The Minister of Children, Community and Social um, Services. The, the uh, email in question was sent out by the Progressive Conservative Party of Ontario, and it was sent out because we're proud that we're going to be eliminating the wait list for 23,000 children, or three out of four children, in the province of Ontario who were denied support by their Ontario government when that member opposite was the minister responsible. What we have done is we are uh, investing almost a double amount of money from the 321 we initially announced over five weeks ago, and we are looking forward to clearing the wait list but also making sure that more children get the type of support that they need in this particular case. And that's why we are going to continue to double the investments in the diagnostic hubs. That's also why we are going to provide more choice for parents with their childhood budget, including speech and occupational therapy. We're also going to continue to consult with families over the next six months as we develop a needs-based uh, severity test, as well as extending those to children, the 25 per cent who are currently in service, to receive uh, additional service over the next six months. That's what our plan is about, and that's why we're proud of it. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I don't believe I heard a, a, an answer there. This is a question about the tone, uh, the appropriateness of sending out such a, a fundraising request. Um, the Premier was elected uh, by going out there and telling people that he was going to put more money in the pockets of people, and I actually believe that he wants to do that. I believe he actually meant it. But this new program is doing something different, Mr. Speaker. It's actually bankrupting families here in Ontario. I believe that the changes the minister made, in fact, uh, put us backwards, Mr. Speaker, send us backwards. And it's not good enough for families. So I'm going to ask the question again uh, to the Deputy Premier. Um, does the Deputy Premier think it's appropriate to send out a PC government, uh, a PC party 
email asking people to donate money back to the party and within that email, Mr. Speaker, Question. to embed an actual government press release. Does, does the Deputy Premier think that's appropriate? It's a simple question. The question has been referred to the Minister of Children, Community and Social uh, Services. Thanks very much, Speaker. Let me be perfectly clear. Under the previous Liberal administration, they spent $256 million on autism. Under the Ontario Progressive Conservative Party, that will be over $600 million. If they want to talk about being bankrupt, they bankrupted our pro province, they bankrupted the Ontario Autism Program, and when they left office, they were bankrupt of ideas. I am standing here today to say that we will clear the wait list of 23,000 children. We will ensure every single child with autism gets a level of support from their Ontario government. Order. There will not be an income test. There will be lots of choice in how they spend their, an their annual childhood budget, including in speech and occupational therapy. We're going to continue to consult. As I mentioned yesterday, I met with Autism Ontario, who will be our chief navigator with families on how they how they work through and navigate through the system, and we are going to ensure that those children who are currently in service, those 25 per cent of the children that the previous Liberal administration Response. supported, will have an additional grace period of six months of the service that they currently have. So let me be perfectly clear. We're proud of the program we're building. We're proud. Order. Order. Next question, the member for Markham Stouffville. Mr. Speaker, our government, as you know, was elected on a promise to stand up for taxpayers. Here, here. We promised, of course, during the last election to put more money into the pockets of Ontario families. That's here, why here. my question to the Minister of Finance is this. After 15 years of the Liberal NDP coalition tax and spend policies, Mr. Speaker, policies that I believe hurt Ontario families, I built on the work done by the member for Milton for policy insurance policy. And introduced my Respecting Property Taxpayers Act 2019. Now, Mr. Speaker, the bill, if passed, will give taxpayers an equal voice on the board of the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. My private member's bill will actually bring taxpayers to the table. I wonder if the Minister of Finance could comment Question. on the importance of this initiative. Here, here. The Minister of Finance. Thank you, uh, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Markham Stouffville for his leadership on this file. The Rest Respecting Property Taxpayers Act, if passed, will make sure that the taxpayer has a greater voice when it comes to property taxes in the province of Ontario. The bill proposes moving from four taxpayer representatives to seven on the MPAC Board of Directors. By doing so, the bill, if passed, would ensure that there is an even representation between municipal interests and the interests of the taxpayer. The bill shows exactly the kind of initiative we need to see in order to restore respect to the Ontario taxpayers. We look forward to debating this bill in the weeks to come and to stand up for the hard-working people in the province of Ontario. Here, here. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the Minister of Finance for that response. Uh, it's great, obviously, to see the support that this bill is already getting, and I'm confident and I'm hopeful that when the bill makes it to this place for further debate that we will see support from all members of the, of the here, legislature, here. Here, here. because all members, I'm sure, would agree that Ontario families deserve better. Mr. Speaker, I hope we can all work together because taxpayers have asked for this change. It's about time as well, Mr. Speaker. You know, after 15 years of Liberal NDP coalition tax and spend policies, Ontario taxpayers are finally optimistic. They're optimistic that they have a government that is focused on putting more money back in their pockets, but is also focused on respecting them and their hard work. I wonder if the minister could go further and comment a little bit further on how important this initiative Question. is to property taxpayers across Ontario. Minister. Well, thank you again, Speaker. After ignoring the people of Ontario for 15 years, the Liberals left behind a disastrous record. The Liberals, supported by the NDP, were spending $40 million a day more than they took in. There was no accountability in the tax and spend policies of that government. Taxpayers had no voice. Our government is changing that, and the member from Markham-Stouffville is changing that through his proposed bill. His bill 
if passed, would be yet another way to restore respect for taxpayers and make sure they have their voices heard when it comes to property taxes. Speaker, our government is standing up for the taxpayers, and we look forward to debating this bill in the weeks to come. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Next question, the member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. We've learned there was a 15 per cent increase in the number of people who died from opioid-related deaths in the first six months of 2018. New Democrats have called on the government to declare a public health emergency and direct Im immediate resources where it's needed to combat the growing crisis. Yet, while a record number of people are dying, the minister has delayed approving consumption and treatment center applications, and the future of these harm reduction services remains unknown after Sunday. <coughs> Will the minister immediately approve and fund all of the existing overdose prevention sites and commit to funding additional sites beyond the arbitrary 21 site cap? Minister, members, please take their seats. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. The opioid issue is an important concern for all of us in the province of Ontario. It is a public health emergency, and it is something that we have put our attention to. The um, consumption and treatment centres are still already open. They have been able to remain open throughout as they transition from overdose prevention sites to consumption and treatment services sites, which is what we want to see. We want to see people have their lives saved, of course, but also to get into the treatment services that they want and need. So we are, the services and the sites are still open. We are aware of the March 31st deadline. We are working very hard on that. We are reviewing those applications and making final decisions, and I will have more to say about it in the next few days. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the minister. The federal government has earmarked $1.9 billion in federal dollars for mental health and addictions care if the provincial government agreed to match the funding. Money that could go towards the worsening opioid crisis and improving mental health and addiction services for Ontarians. All 629 opioid-related deaths could have been prevented. However, the bilateral agreement shows that this government isn't spending a dime as part of the agreement in the first term. Why is the minister leaving $1.9 billion on the table when mental health and addiction services are in a state of crisis and more lives are being lost every day? Members, please take their seats. Minister. Well, the member is correct. There has been a commitment made by the federal government of $1.9 billion, which is being matched by the provincial government. Here, here. Same amount for a total of $3.8 billion over 10 years to deal with mental health and addictions issues in the province of Ontario. We are actively working on it. We are working with the federal government, and I can say that there have been investments that have been made already. That is where you are not correct. There have been investments that are being made. We are actively in consultations. We've had many across the province. Many great solutions have appeared, but we are putting together a comprehensive and connected mental health and addiction system. I look forward to discussing your ideas and the members of your caucus with the members of the other parties to make sure that we get this right, because $3.8 billion is a lot of money, and we want to make sure that we can put it towards event issues and services Response. that are going to save lives, including more detox beds, more mental health beds, more community services, and so on. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts on it um, at another time in a, in a discussion with you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next question, member for Kitchener, Conestoga. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food, Food and Rural Affairs. Many Ontarians good are he is a good guy. Many Ontarians are concerned by the federal government's carbon tax, and certainly those in the agricultural community are no exception, Mr. Speaker. It is no secret that a carbon tax would increase the cost of putting food on tables across the province. When production costs increase, less money goes into the pockets of farmers and workers. All the while, consumers feel the strain in their wallets at the checkout. Stakeholders across Ontario's agri-food sector have also raised concerns about economic impact, job losses, cost of production, and they feel that the carbon tax will not help the environment or reduce emissions at all. Could the minister please tell the House about the work our government is doing to stand up for farmers and oppose the carbon tax? Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member from Kitchener-Conestoga for that excellent question. Speaker, it was great to have the Premier and the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks join me in my riding for a roundtable to discuss the job-killing federal carbon tax. Our farmers are already leaders in environmental stewardship. I've heard time and time again from farmers, agribusiness leaders, experts in the agriculture sector about the damaging impact that the carbon tax will have on agriculture in Ontario. It will stifle growth and innovation, and it will cause a significant increase in costs from heating fuels to transportation costs. This government has been against the carbon tax of any kind from day one, and standing up against the federal carbon tax is just one way we will continue to advocate for Ontario's farmers and farm families. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the minister for his answer. Uh, I am proud to be part of a government that is working tirelessly to advocate on behalf of yeah, Ontario's yeah. farmers and farm families. Contra. Farmers in my riding have told me loud and clear, Mr. Speaker, that this carbon tax is only going to drive up their costs of production and make their businesses less competitive. The federal carbon tax is nothing but another cash grab from the Trudeau Liberals to keep taxing and spending as they head into an election year. This tax will do little to help the environment or reduce carbon emissions. I know our government is committed to protecting our environment while also creating jobs and making life more affordable for hardworking Ontarians. Could the minister please tell the House how our Made in Ontario Environment Plan will balance economic and environmental sustainability? Minister. To the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. The minister, minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, last week I did have the opportunity to, uh, to be with the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Affairs and the Premier uh, down in Oxford. Mr. Speaker, it was a real pleasure to meet with our agricultural community, be in a place where they call him Ernie, not Minister. And, Mr. Speaker, um, Farmers and members of our agribusiness community are very concerned about what's going to happen next week. They're very concerned about Justin Trudeau's carbon tax. Five cents a litre, Mr. Speaker, seven and a half cents on diesel fuel, and that just goes up and up from there. Up Mr. Speaker, they are worried, and they're rightly worried, about the cost of food, the cost of food that they put on the tables of Ontarians. How much is that food going to cost a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, as that carbon tax costs more and more and more? Mr. Speaker, they know like Ontarians know. You don't need a carbon tax to fight climate change. We have a Made in Ontario Response. plan that will reduce greenhouse right. gas emissions and not punish Ontario families Regressive. and not punish Ontario farmers. And Mr. Speaker, we're going to make that point every day and every week to make sure Ontarians know. Next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Over the last 15 years, mills and forestry operations have closed all over northwestern Ontario. That includes at least five in Thunder Bay, two in Dryden, two in Kenora, one in Sioux Lookout, and one in Fort Francis. Those closures came with devastating job losses and hurt thousands of families. A company wants to use wood from the Crossroot Forest to bring back forestry jobs to Fort Francis. The town contends the company is transferring crown fiber from the Crossroot Forest to its other operation in northwestern Ontario, contrary to the terms in a sustainable forest license agreement. And the forest industry is in crisis again. Just last week, a couple of weeks ago, in Thessalon, Midway Lumber has laid off 30 per cent of their workforce as well. Will the minister tell the families in Fort Francis, Thessalon, and across the north that he will ensure that mills and forestry operations have the wood they need to operate and support the hundreds of direct and indirect jobs that depend on them? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I thank the member uh, for his uh, question. Wood supply is a critical issue for my ministry and all across Ontario, and it is one of the things that in the past 15 years, the previous government lost sight of the importance of forestry in this province, and we are not doing that. In fact, I've been holding a series of forestry roundtables throughout the province. Recently, I was in Thunder Bay. That was the fifth of a series of seven or eight that we will have. I, I want to say to the member, the issue of uh, uh, wood fiber for the, for, for the potential Fort Francis Mill, and I want to give my uh, credit to my colleague from uh, Kenora Rainy River, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. 
for his, the work that he has been doing working with uh, the town of Fort Francis to try to uh, broker a, a solution to this. The reality is that we must wait until such time as there is a purchase for the for the mill in, Fran in Fort Francis before we can Response. discuss the issue of, of uh, wood supply for any mill. There are mills currently working in the north. The Cross Route Forest uh, under the SFL has commitments. Uh, should a, uh, a, 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 a sale be be finalized, we will reopen those discussions. Thank you very much. Supplementary. The mill sale could not happen without a wood allocation to it. Again, to the minister, let me quote the MPP from Perry Salmaskoka, who, as PC critic, asked this question in 2014 to former Premier Wynne, and I quote, the sustainable forest license in the Fort Francis area is controlled by the past operator of the paper mill. They are no longer interested in running the mill, but continue to control the Crown Forest, the Cross Root Forest. Don't you think the license to harvest wood, or at a minimum, an economic supply of fibre from nearby forests, should go to the company willing to locate operations and reopen the mill in Fort Francis? Minister, your government controls the wood rights on Crown lands. It also has the obligation to involve First Nations communities and meaningful consultations. But as the Liberals did before, this Ford government is sitting on their hands instead of taking an action. Question. Will the minister ensure that Fort Francis and Thessalon have the wood fibre they need? Minister. Well, the, the issue in, in, in Thessalon, as the member knows, is an, is an issue, issue of negotiations being between Thessalon First Nation as well. It is not simply a matter of wood supply. The issue in, Fort, in, uh, in the Crossroot Forest, as you know, there is a wood allocation that has been made, and there, the, the wood is being used in other mills. Should a, a deal be um, brokered together by someone who is uh, prepared to operate the Fort Francis mill location? Uh, that is something that we would we would relook at that at that allocation. But I want to point out very much: our government would nothing would like nothing more than to see mills operating that have been closed in the north that were closed under the previous government. We would love to see them operating, and that is why we have embarked on a new forest strategy to ensure that there is an adequate wood supply. We the, we used to harvest 30 million cubic meters of of, of, uh, of fiber out of the in Ontario. And we're down, pardon me, 24, and we're down to about 15. If we can increase that Response. by having a proper forest strategy, we can ensure that there are jobs, good jobs in the north. But it is the previous government that saw that dwindle down and saw jobs in the lost. We're focusing on jobs, creating jobs in the north. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Perry Sound, Muskoka. The question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Our government for the people understands how significant the forestry sector is to the economy of Ontario. For 15 years, the previous government ignored and neglected an industry that is extremely important to communities across rural and northern Ontario. I know that the Premier and our Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry have both been working very hard to make Ontario open for business and open for jobs, including forestry. Uh, I was pleased to hear that businesses from my riding were invited to a roundtable in North Bay earlier this month. Can the Minister inform the House who is being consulted to help build and regrow Ontario's forestry sector? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, speak, very much, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the member for Parry Sound Muskoka for his question and the tremendous advocacy that he has had for his community and the forest industry for over 18 years in this chamber. He's right. We are making Ontario open for business and open for jobs. Since November, as I said in the previous question, we have embarked on forestry roundtables throughout the province as we develop a new forestry strategy that puts Ontario's forestry industry at the front. 
not the back, like the previous government, where they ignored it for 15 years. We're putting it back at the front. It's a bedrock industry in this province, and we're going to treat it as such. Last Friday, I was in Thunder Bay, where I heard many great suggestions about how our government can reduce barriers and promote economic growth in this tremendously important industry. While the previous Liberal government stifled growth in the forestry sector by prioritizing special interest groups, our government for the people and I, my ministry will continue our work to make sure that Ontario is open for business and open for jobs. Thank you. That concludes the time we have for question period today, but I recognize the Mem Minister of Government and Consumer Services on a point of order. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I just want to remind all the members of the Spring into Cider reception being hosted by the Ontario Craft Cider Association between 11.30 and 2 p.m. today down in the Legislative Dining Room in the sidebar area. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the motion for the third reading of Bill 68, an act with respect to community safety and policing. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bell.
Members, please take your seats. On March 25th, are the members in their seats? On March 25, 2019, Ms. Jones moved third reading of Bill 68, an act with respect to community safety and policing. All those in favour of the motion will please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Walker. 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 M